video interview. Kay, thanks for joining us today. Kay is the host of Good Morning Football on the NFL Network, along with a myriad of other things. Kay, how's it going today? Wonderful. I can't believe I, I, there's a lot of pressure now that I'm the first one. But welcome to my kitchen, my dry cleaning, my laundry, my luggage from Kansas City. The cheap car set up down there. I like it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, I know this is a really busy time for you and NFL preseason's over. How excited are you for the start of the NFL season? Oh, we are just, I can just smell the beer and the nachos. And it was so great to be part of the Chiefs preseason on the sidelines. I hadn't been to a game since the Super Bowl in Miami. So uh, I was missing it. The energy, the fans, everyone is just so excited to have it back. And a sense of normalcy is what we all need. So I want to start out with uh, how you got to where you are right now. Kind of a, a long journey for you, right? You started a, a music station. How did that all come about to from the <laughs> humble beginnings back in Chicago, where I am right now, to where you are? Yes. I, I, well, I grew up in Chicago. I went to the University of Missouri and I just wanted to get any sort of foot in the door. So I basically, don't, don't do this at home, kids, but I lied and I didn't lie. I fibbed a little bit about my acumen, my knowledge uh, in the country music scene. And I wanted to get on the air. There was a spot open from midnight to 6 a.m., Fridays and Saturdays. And I said, OK, I need that. Like, I need that job. So I talked to the program director and she's like, do you know, like, country music. Uh-huh. Sure I do. And she let me on and I studied up really hard and I would do that shift. And it was right next door to an ESPN affiliate at the same radio group. So I go get my Folgers at three in the morning, four in the morning, or I check on a tornado warning in Jefferson County or wherever I was. Uh, and uh, we'd share a cup of coffee with the ESPN guys. Eventually they invited me on. I liked sports. I found it very easy to talk about sports and sort of have an opinion and reinforce it with numbers. And it sort of took on from there. Who are your biggest broadcasting influences? Oh, I don't know that I have many. Honestly, I didn't. A sideline was never something that I was super interested in. So some of the, the women who I loved were in those spots. I would say my someone who I look up to and I cannot believe even knows who I am is Andrea Kramer. Mm -hmm. Just the way she's gone about what she does. It's all about credibility, establishing that or you have nothing. Um, and she just is one of the most hardworking people that I've ever been around yet somehow still has the grace to stop and give me advice. She's, she's everything I'd want to be. She's great. You know, what, the thing I think I love about the, the show is how much fun you guys have while at the same time being informative. How do you kind of balance that? I think you have to take what the day gives you. It's a three hour show. It's live television. We've had the, um, unfortunate responsibility, of dealing with tragedies, dealing with natural disasters, dealing with the passing of owners that mean so much to the game, living legends, legends of the past, um, unsavory topics that come across us, you know, at all times of the night and morning. And it's, it's really trying to maintain a balance. Everyone sort of does their role really well. I find my role to be more of the you know, the the driver slash wet blanket, a little bit of more the hall monitor, police officer, school teacher that's like, OK, well, let's get back on on path or let's make sure we we get to the serious part or, you know, the tone changes are, are sort of I, my responsibility and I embrace them. For even just this morning, talking about Hurricane Ida yesterday, I write it, just hit the whole staff up and said, how are we handling this? Do we have any messaging from the league? Is there a, a Red Cross number that we should be giving out to people? So there wasn't that information from the league yet as of this morning at five. So instead, at the beginning of every show, though, it's high energy. and We want to get into these fun highlights. I did say to everybody watching in Louisiana and the Gulf Coast region, like our hearts go out to you. So you sort of have to be aware of this 24 hour news cycle. So, so it, we bear that responsibility in the morning. You know, I'm going to put you on the spot. Uh, I know you guys like to have fun. You could like to banter back and forth, but uh, who's your favorite co-host and why? Oh, I, <laughs> you think I'm an idiot? I'm not answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny. I was just interviewing Patrick Mahomes. You heard it here first. He'll be my sit down interview for week one on NFL game day with Rich Eisen. And I sat down with him and I asked him, you know, he has a six month old baby. And I go, Patrick, who would you trust to babysit your new newborn? And I figured he'd say, I'm not answering that. He answered it like that, gave me an answer, gave me a well-reasoned answer. And I said, that's going to cause some trouble in the locker room, Patrick. But thank you for giving me the scoop. Uh, everybody, you know, has, they're near and dear to my heart in different ways. Nate leaving was an absolute dagger because of mm -hmm. um, his presence and what he does. And he really made the show go. So I'll say none of the above. 
very diplomatic. I, I appreciate that. You, you straddle the line very well there. Um, okay, give me a brief overview of your schedule leading into the into this uh, season. I know you're doing some other things, but how much research are you doing? How much film are you watching or anything? Or you just kind of play it close? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, roll with it. from four preseason to games to three has been interesting from, from everybody's perspective. Uh, a lot of the more starters have played than I thought would. So, yeah, it's, you know, I've spent my Saturdays and Sundays watching games, of course, already uh, as every preseason. Um, it's not hard to study and research because it just becomes a part of who you are. We've done the show five years now. It's an ever evolving cycle. There's new news all the time. And it's one of those things where you're surprised how much you know, because you live in it. I live and breathe the headlines of the NFL proudly. So uh, as far as research and studying, yeah, you have to have it straight, but there's not really the, the beauty of our show is that it's 365 days a year, basically it's 24 seven. So there's not that, Oh, let me get away and get it out of my head for six months, come back. And like, what's gone on, what's changed. We live through those changes, those off season additions, the accidents, the, the dramas that are ongoing, the whole Aaron Rodgers saga, something that we lived and reported on all off season long. So uh, as far as, feeling like I need to cram or get ready for anything. No, uh, my schedule will be Monday through Fridays and Good Morning Football, of course, three hours of live TV. There, I will be part of game day morning. I will be um, on location for some of the bigger games, uh, like Tom Brady going back up to visit his Patriots in New England. I get the honor of being there for that one. Uh, I, I'll do some interviews and some uh, hits on game day morning on Sunday with Rich Eisen and the crew on NFL Network. I'll be part of Amazon's programming um, again for the third year. So happy to have my work family there back, Chris Long. And, they're, uh, and it's incredibly exciting stuff going on, of course, at Amazon. So happy to be back with them. And then I've got some interesting little wrinkles that are not yet to be announced. So super, super looking forward to that. So you're not busy at all is what you're saying. It's so fun, though. Somebody is saying yeah. it's, you know, sometimes you wake up at three in the morning to watch highlights from the night before. But if you really love the subject matter, it's not even about like that. You can't there's loving the job. But if you love what you are there to talk about, it's hard to have a bad day. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you, you're busy. So you call it 365. But what do you like to do when you're not on camera or when you're not studying? What, what do you do away from football? I love to travel. I love to uh, hike. So any sort of traveling to go, you know, Costa Rica or uh, lately, I'm usually I'm not usually a beach vacation person, but maybe I have been working too hard. So I've been very into the the beach life. Um, visiting my family in Chicago, I'm very close to my niece uh, and my parents, and I understand they won't be around forever. So I like to spend as much time with them as possible. But mostly traveling. I mean, I live in New York City, right here in the heart of Manhattan. So it's never never hard to fill my time with fun stuff. Now uh, let's talk a little football. Um, you mentioned some of the bigger story. Or I want to ask you about some of the bigger storylines. You mentioned Tom Brady. Obviously, that's one of the bigger ones, the Bucks, and how he's able to continue on. But what are some of the bigger storylines you see heading into the season? Yeah, I think there's a, an interesting spot that we're in now where this is the first wave. I'm still young enough to not have kissed away my quarterbacks that I've grown up watching and loving, or at least liking Philip Rivers. I mean, him leaving was tough. Drew Brees, like those things are hitting me. And I know that like older sports fans or older NFL fans are used to that, but I'm like, these are my guys. Like, what do you mean Lamar is going to come in here and take their spot? Or what do you mean uh, there's this new crop of young, exciting, flashy, speedy, dual threat quarterbacks taking over. So uh, it's interesting to watch. I mean, what Tom Brady did was so undeniable, but he's the oldest quarterback out there doing it. So can someone come and really take that torch from him? Uh, the struggle between him and Patrick Mahomes is super, super interesting. And I think from uh, a, a more AFC perspective, that's where I think the heavyweights are. And did the Bills and the Browns do enough? Like those are the two teams, maybe the Ravens, we'll see. Did the Bills and the, and the Browns do enough to sort of unseat Patrick Mahomes? Because I spent the entire preseason with them. And they just look unstoppable to me. They really do. I think they're launching something that we have not seen in the NFL before because we've never seen, you know, we've seen it with Brady and the stability that he's had there for decades. But this was a huge contract given to him. He's on the same page. He's got the entire support of the entire team around him. I think they're making him, uh, they're on their way to making him a global superstar. You know, I know from watching the show and following your Twitter, you're very into fantasy football. How many Fancy football teams do you have? Do you have a really good name for one of them? And um, give me some of your sleepers. I know you got you got a little controversy when TMZ 
call you, you call one of the, like CD Lamb a sleeper, which I don't think you really did, but they jumped yeah. all over that. So no, yeah, there was a there had to be you know some kid three in the morning having to put up a right. post, whatever you know. I right. I call it getting big fonted. They put something in big font <laughs> that you say and send it out. Right. Uh, but I do love fantasy football. It's how I got got my my foot in the door. I came and was plucked from NBC Sports out of St. Louis, where I was living, uh, to help launch Sirius XM's fantasy sports station. So big thanks to Steve Cohen over there at Sirius XM for seeing something in me. And then NBC Sports sort of took over from there. They had a partnership with Yahoo, so fantasy football was very prevalent there. I was always really passionate about it, very competitive, and I like numbers even though I don't like math, which I can't figure out. But uh, I'm in about three leagues now. I used to do about seven or eight and just be crazy, but I don't have the time for it anymore. Um, daily fantasy is super interesting. So I do my my fan duel lineups uh, on the weekends there as well. And uh, I would say I don't have a team name yet. I haven't drafted any of my leagues yet. We're doing them just the week of the actual start of the season, like I like to do as close to, to kickoff as possible. Um, and yeah, CD lamb is a guy that I really think is going to break out. It's very rare for a player that I hear about or read about or, and then look at the numbers for it to all line up, right. but reporters across the board, analysts, insiders, former wide receivers. And then the numbers with him and Dak Prescott, when Dak was healthy really stand out. And he just seems like one of those players that's going to just take the league by storm this year. Let me ask you about um, the business a little bit. You know, we're seeing more women on the field. We're seeing more women in front office of the NFL. Um, is enough being done there? And what are the biggest challenges for women in, in this business? Yeah, I know a couple of women that are, are very happy with how it's going and a couple of them that are discouraged still that not enough is being done. I love going from team to team and seeing more uh, female faces. I talked to coach Andy Reid about it in the preseason. Um, he had Katie Sowers uh, on the field with him. He had nothing but great things to say. Norma Hunt, just staying in Kansas City, has a foundation that she's launched a fellowship where she's trying to get more women involved in personnel. There's a lot of initiatives for that, it's a tough boys club to turn over. It's tough on multiple levels. It's ingrained as part of the game, but I do like seeing that things are happening in the right way. And I think a lot of it has to do with some really inspiring and progressive women in the front or uh, on Park Avenue with the NFL, Sam Rappaport being one of them. I don't know if you've ever had the pleasure of speaking with her, but she is uh, an undeniable talent and she's changing the game. And so I'm happy to, to see that happen. And I can't wait to see it not be a story. You know, um, so what advice would you give a young person who want to get in, into business, uh, into this broadcasting business, or both, you know, men and women, but especially for a woman trying to come in and break through, what advice are you giving them? Yeah, I, I've always, uh, whether this is right or wrong, I've always, and Michelle Tafoya reinforced this to me, and I felt really good about it when I interviewed her a couple of years ago. Just, I've never focused on being a woman in sports. I never let it drive me or let it, it was never in my head, whether that's naive or not. I just never wanted it to be part of the story. So I just focused on being the best in the room, working hard on the person to my left or right, whether they were a woman, a man, just like without any differences. So I know that there's politics involved and there's precedent and there's things to work through. I've just, I've always just maintained, I'm going to try to outwork everybody in the business. So I would say, say yes to the 12 to six country radio jobs that might land you a, you know, a cameo on a ESPN affiliate in the middle of mid Missouri. So while you're drinking terrible coffee, go ahead and say yes to that. Uh, I, wasn't in a, I wasn't in a, a position where I could take as many free, you know, paying or like free internship sort of roles. Uh, I had to work. I worked at a comedy club. I worked, I had to pay for college entirely. I was in debt until into my thirties, just during COVID, I finally paid off my last student loan. Um, I had to take all of that onto myself. So I would work you know, at a bar until five in the morning, go do a Cardinals game. I got paid in peanuts for being the girl on the Megatron after college to, uh, to, you know, reward uh, section 208 with, you know, free popcorn or whatever it was for the day. Here's your Apple vacation. You're the winner. All of that stuff. They didn't really, you know, you, you were paying for the, the experience and to offset that I really uh, had to punt on a lot of fun things. I punted on, you know, relationships and friendships and trips and all of that. But, I, it's a choice that I made. Sounds like you're very dedicated. I know you've got a, a tremendous work ethic. Where does that come from? 
My mom and my dad, 100%. They, they live in Chicago. They came to America in 1978 and from Poland. My dad worked at the same factory. It was a screw factory in Melrose Park, Illinois for 43 years and then retired. My mother also worked in the factory and cleaned hotel rooms later in her life because she got uh, she got sick, she got cancer and she couldn't keep up with the factory work that she was doing. And I just think I, I we really didn't have much and they just instilled this, there wasn't another way, just work hard and, and they came here and it was truly an American dream story where I was the youngest of three. My sister taught me English. My mother still, you know, lives in Chicago, barely speaks English because her banker's Polish or right. the deli's Polish. It's a very Polish community, Polish friendly community. Uh, but all of that was definitely an, uh, a sort of attributed to an immigrant mentality of my parents coming here for a better life and me feeling like I want to show them that their sacrifices were worth it. Along the lines of helping people and getting help, you've done a lot of uh, work with Muscular Dystrophy Association. Why is that so passionate to you? My sister, so we'll have to, we'll have to go deep into it. My sister-in-law, it was my best friend through college, and she married my brother. And she works for Muscular Dystrophy Association. And so I'd go, she lives in Chicago, and I would go uh, for the past 10 years or so and go to events that she would be putting on and fundraisers with the Chicago fire fire department. And uh, I really just sort of saw through her, how passionate she was and how much these children, their families uh, affected her on a very obvious basis. So I just got involved and I ended up signing up to, I mean, and I can't run a mile. Like I got out of running a mile in college, like in high school, I had like a doctor's no, no way. That kind of a work ethic. Okay. But I signed up to do a half marathon. I was really moved by so many of the families that I met and these just tremendous kids who, are survivors and they're really inspiring and it's been very cool to see there's a bit of an nfl fabric that connects to that players like naheem hines who plays for the colts or clyde edwards hilaire actually has a sister um who deals with with it every day with uh, muscular dystrophy neuromuscular diseases and, and all of that so there's also this sense of hope with it where there is medicine there are things getting approved there could be an end to this someday. And that sort of optimism really gets me going. So whenever they have an event or a fundraiser or something, a gala that I can host, I'm happy to do it because uh, it's big in my hometown. You mentioned your hometown. I want to do a quick lightning round for Chicago. I'm in Chicago. I've been here my whole life. And I know you're from Chicago. I'm, I'm from the western suburbs, from Hinsdale. And I live I'm downtown. From from yeah, you know Hinsdale? All right. Very, very I think cool. I a prom out there once, Hinsdale. <laughs> <laughs> Is that South, I hope, right? Not Central. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, quick lightning round on Chicago. Um, favorite pizza? Oh, man. Oh. I, it's, it's, uh, I could ask a million questions about sports. I'll go, about Gier I'll go Giordano's. I think that's the one, that's the place that I, I've eaten the most. Yeah. Uh, uh, Cubs or White Sox? Absolutely the Cubs. I threw out the first pitch for them a couple of years ago. It was a bucket list moment. I should have asked that first and we could have cut this short. I'm a White Sox guy. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, a Bears fan growing up or or not or a different team? Definitely a Bears fan. Uh, mm -hmm. My dad was not a football fan at all. He was straight bulls and he's Polish. So he loved just soccer. But we got into the Bears because I had an older brother who just wanted to like assimilate to Americans at school. So we became very interested in the Bears and heartbroken by them. But Matt Forte. Just like was so I would just be up on my couch screaming for Matt Forte. So loved him and Hester and the whole group. So, um, yeah, definitely a Bears fan. Never went to a game, though. There was it's so funny. I was talking to this had to be seven year old kid at the Chiefs game this past weekend. And he said, I, I come to all the games. And I said, well, I hope, you know, you're very lucky yeah, to come sure. to all of these games and be down here and like yelling Mahomes name because I didn't get to go to a game till I was like 23. Uh, and he was like, really? So it's uh, it was good perspective. But yeah, grew up a Bears fan. And just uh, what do you like to do in Chicago when you're here? Uh, do you get down to the lakefront? Do you hit the restaurants? What are you doing? 
Yeah, the, I mean the 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 West Loop is bumping yeah. and amazing. Uh, I would say you know my first stop is always just see my family. They live on the northwest side. My niece Maya is there. She's my best friend in the whole world, and she's five years old and just started kindergarten. So as much time as I can spend with her, but we've done the whole Lincoln Park Zoo bit with her. Of course, she went to the Cubs game where I threw out the first pitch, and she's an unfortunate Chiefs fan. But maybe Justin Fields can change that around. <laughs> you mentioned earlier some of the things you have in the fire, but what's what's next? for you next for me would be i mean i won't lie to you i i have one goal and it's you know to sit at one of those gorgeous seats that are uh for a primetime game that's absolutely what i want they're very rare uh but it would be such an honor and it's what i've really worked for and strategized for my entire career and there's so much excitement in the nfl and different partners and even in the fantasy space with you know Things, people, uh, companies like FanDuel and um, all of that coming into the mix. But what Amazon has going on is truly, truly special. So I'm hoping to be a part of that. Okay. Thanks so much for your time. I could talk to you all day about Chicago, <laughs> about football, about sports. Uh, thanks for taking the time today. We're big fans of the show. And um, also, are you sad you. Nate's gone? What's that? Are you sad Nate's gone? Oh, yeah. I know. It's tough. But you guys, I mean, I just love the camaraderie you guys have. So yeah. uh, that was a big blow. Um, do you have any pitches for who the, who should sit in his seat? Oh, geez. I don't. Um, I could send the resume along. Okay. <laughs> I would love to have you. <laughs> don't tell my bosses, all right? <laughs> it was super sad to see him go. And then, yeah, yeah, I, yeah it'll, it'll, it's, it'll be, we'll see what happens. My contract's coming up here after this year. So there's a lot of excitement uh, with the future of Good Morning Football. Great. Okay. Thanks so much for the time today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Take care.